Well, good afternoon and welcome to the NFF Connect series. Thanks for spending a little time with us today. Um, just a couple of logistics. Uh, everybody's videos will be uh, shut off for the amount of people we have on here and the microphones will be muted. Uh, so if you have a question, comment, please go to the chat window and it'll come to us and uh, time permitting, we can get those uh, to, to, the, to the speakers. So um, first of all, I'd like to welcome today uh, Battalion Chief Jason Reese. Jason, thank you very much for being us today. Thank you for having me. A little bit about Chief Reese. Uh, he has over 25 years of experience, both the career volunteer fire and EMS service. He currently holds the rank of Battalion Chief with the Prince William County Department of Fire and Rescue and is assigned to the Operations Division, leading the 3rd Battalion. Chief Reese has held several positions during his, during his career to include system support overseeing planning logistics, recruit training, advanced leadership training, safety officer, as well as numerous operational positions. He's overseen the Swiftwater Rescue Program and is the chair of the Valor Awards Program. Chief Reitz holds a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Maryland and has served as a peer support member for the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation Coworkers Support Group and is a member of Prince William County's peer support team. So again, welcome Chief and uh, appreciate you taking the time today to share st uh, your story with us. So. Certainly, anytime. So a little about the, the incident we're talking about today. Um, we're gonna talk about a, a structure fire in Prince William County uh, that resulted in line of duty death of, of firefighter Kyle Wilson. And uh, if you remember probably, uh, probably about a year and a half ago, um, Chief Jim Forgo uh, spoke on this from the incident commander perspective. Uh, same fire, and Chief Reese was a company officer at the time, and we'll talk about it from the company officer, officer perspective. So, uh, technician Cal Wilson joined the Prince William County Department of Fire Rescue on January 23rd, 2006, and graduated from the training academy on June 23rd, 2006. He was an ultimate performer, a performer and did everything with drive and determination. He was always committed to the team and the goal. He deeply loved and was dedicated to his family and friends. Everyone who knew Kyle will remember his warm smile, kind heart, and sensitive yet fun-loving personality. He will always remain a hero to all he touched, and his sacrifice will never be forgotten. On April 16, 2007, technician Kyle Wilson was fatally injured while trapped in a master bedroom during a wind-driven residential structure fire. 0603 hours, dispatch reported a single-family house fire. At 609, Kyle's ladder truck was second to arrive on the scene. Fire was visible at the back exterior corner of the residence. Noticing cars in the driveway, no one outside, and no lights visible in the house, the crews of the first in engine and truck company attempted to perform a primary search of the residence. Connell's lieutenant wearing their SCBA entered the residence through the unlocked front door. Light smoke showing, they walked up the stairs to check the bedrooms. Connell's lieutenant cleared the top of the stairs and went straight to the master bedroom. With smoke beginning to show at ceiling level, Kyle did a right-hand search while lieutenant with the thermal imaging camera checked the bed. Suddenly, the room turned black, then orange with flames. Yelled to Kyle to, to get out. While well, verbal communication among the crew was maintained, the lieutenant found the doorway and moved toward the stairs and ended up falling down the stairs to a curve located midway in the staircase. He tried to direct Kyle to the stairs verbally and with a flashlight. The winds gusted up to 48 miles an hour. The wind-driven fire and smoke engulfed the residence. At 6.14 hours, a rescue company officer issued a mayday followed by the victim's mayday. With protection from hose lines, several attempts were made by the engine and rescue company crews to reach the second floor. On the third attempt, the stair landing was reached, but the ceiling started collapsing and flames intensified. At 621 hours, due to the intensity of the fire throughout the structure, all firefighters were evacuated. Operations in turn defensive, but the incident continued in rescue mode. At 657 hours, Kyle was found in the master bedroom, partially on a couch underneath the front windows. Again, Chief, thanks uh, for uh, joining us today and telling us a little bit about the incident from the company offer perspective. Uh, one thing, Chief Reese, is uh, with our company officer cohort, we have several uniform support group programs, and one of them is the company officer to company officer program, which just like it sounds, uh, company officers can reach out to other company officers that experience a line of duty death to help them through the process. And Chief Reese is, is a member of that cohort and help us, uh, is developing the program in that. So uh, well-versed in this program for us. So Chief, let's start the most important thing. Tell us about firefighter Kyle Wilson. Who was he? What do you want people to know about him? Um, Kyle's a great kid. Um, he's one of those, uh, I'll call him a diamond in the rough, probably the best way to put it. Um, when he came to us, he was a rookie at Station 12, but we were assigned at normally on the engine. And um, he was a go-getter. He was that kid that every every officer wants to have on the, on the crew. He was always asking questions, always being a student of the game. And um, you couldn't give the kid enough information. Um, he just was one of those guys that just he loved every bit about this uh, job and was taking everything in. Um, always had a great attitude, great, you know, even when making mistakes or doing something wrong, it, it was always something fun with it. Like you said earlier, a giant smile on his face. I mean, just a, a wonderful kid, a wonderful person. Um, never met someone who wasn't his friend um, kind of guy. And uh, 
like you said, going through, you know, him himself, his rookie year, we have a probationary manual that we, we keep it pretty um, laid out where we go back through a lot of the stuff they learn in their uh, rookie school. But, um, you know, the, the training academy, we, we kind of draw it out over a year um, and kind of do that. Well, at the time, that was about a year long program or just to get back and keep making sure they had retention and that kind of thing. He'd finished it in about four months. Um, and was wanting to learn more and more and more. So, um, and that's the reason he was on the ladder truck relatively early in his career. We don't, again, normally as a department, we try not to put um, newer guys on the ladder truck, but he had performed multiple times. This wasn't his first time on a ladder truck and, and that kind of stuff. So he, he'd shown the ability to do the job extremely well. And um, like I said, in down in Alabama, you know, the conditions that we were in when that uh, attic flashed on us, um, there's no way I would have been able to do a, a May Day as clean and as precise as he did in the conditions that he was doing um, is a testament to his skill on the job. Uh, great family kid. Um, he went and had dinner. His mom uh, but, you know, just recently retired from the hospital. She was uh, worked up at the uh, ER here at the, one of our local hospitals. So we've known her for years. We've known Kyle before he was even in uh, when he was in high school and that kind of stuff. So we, we knew about him. We knew them. He knew his family. He's always having dinner with them. Um, and still the Wilson family to this day is extremely close, tight knit, and uh, still pretty involved with us. You know, we still do a lot of stuff with them. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Tell us a little bit about the day of the incident. Um, day of the incident was uh, April 16, 2007. It was a, uh, Kind of normal April type day, um, except for several of us noted driving in um, that the winds were extremely um, gusting, uh, enough to where it would move your car across half a lane and you know coming up the interstate, coming into work. Um, that morning was one of those that didn't didn't think twice really much about it, but knew it was there um, in regards to the wind. And like I said, all of us kind of made that note coming in that um, it's kind of weird that we we're getting that kind of gust of, of moving enough of your vehicle while driving around. Um, morning thing was no, was a normal morning shift, you know, trade, uh, change off, um, the night before, I mean, I can get into this when we get into the story a little bit, the night before the, uh, volunteers had run a brush fire and, uh, taken the, uh, one of the portals off the ladder truck. Um, at, at night we didn't staff that during that time, uh, this department was a, uh, had daytime hours for the ladder trucks. It was 6 AM to 6 PM. And then at night there's, if volunteers came in, they came in. Um, so they had taken the port, the officer's bucket portable off of a rig and took it on the brush truck. So reality is Kyle didn't even have a radio that day or because it was still left on the brush truck, but, uh, we can get into the story later on when we go over the incident a little bit more, of, um, some heads up thinking by the individuals in the back that were working for me at the time. Um, morning was normal, normal kind of process. Um, just get in, start getting your checkout, your gear ready, uh, checking the rigs out, that kind of thing. We do our shift, uh, it changes our start of our shift is at 0600. Um, so this fire came out right when we were smack in the middle of getting everything ready. It was like five, six minutes after six when this thing was dispatched initially. Um, Kyle didn't even hear the dispatch. He was up in the uh, bucket checking his air pack out. So when he turned the air pack on, the bells went off and all the whistles and all that kind of stuff and never even heard the dispatch. Um, he looked at me like I was crazy because he saw, I saw it because the MDC went off and I, I saw the actual, uh, you know, dispatch information come up on our computer. And so I, I was already getting dressed, already had the, my pants on. And by the time he saw me, he was out back in the rig with all his gear on before I had my coat completely on yet in uh, Superman style fashion, so to speak, you know, <laughs> and uh, we were up and off, off and out the door um, relatively pretty quick. So it's kind of the day of it. I mean, it's a pretty straightforward day. All right. Tell us about the incident uh, when you, when you arrived on the scene. All right. So going down the road, we got, um, we're getting a multiple reports at six in the morning and, and this time of day around the DC area. I mean, the, the world is usually bustling quite a bit at six and six in the morning. I mean, there's cars everywhere. 95 is usually backed up already. You know, it's not one of those, uh, uh, things. So there's always, there's always people moving around. Um, Going down the road, we were getting some updates at uh, of addresses. Um, the actual address we were dispatched to is the actually on the opposite side of Marsh Overlook. Uh, Marsh Overlook is a um, horseshoe style street. So uh, 
the actual initial first call that came in was from somebody else on the seeing the back side of the house. Um, so we were getting a bunch of wrong information for what location of the house was initially. Um, and uh, that changed up as we were going down the road. So some of the information was was um, coming in kind of late to get us exactly where we were going. Um, engine pulled up uh, to the first hydrant, dropped its line. We leapfrogged over them and um, got up in front, tried to take positioning. Um, we ended up taking positioning at the uh, AB corner of the uh, structure because uh, when we got there, there was nothing but it was all heavy fire on the back side. It looked like on the uh, first floor, it looked like it was starting to work itself up into the uh, E's. It didn't look like it had gotten there yet from the, the initial on scene. Um, from that BC corner, as we were uh, sorry, yeah, from the, in the BC corner of the uh, where we were pulling in. Um, so I decided to hold us up a little bit short because all the smoke and everything was being blown across the front of the house. So I couldn't see um, the actual front of the structure um, because of all the smoke and things out there. And I didn't want to run into somebody, hit a car, hit or anything. We didn't know what was going on um, in regards to that. So there was cars in the driveway, cars uh, in front of the house. And surprisingly, not a soul outside. Nobody was outside at all. Um, so we got off the rig. The engine came back around us. Um, I met with the engine officer, who was a, a guy I went to recruit school with, known him for years, fought fires with him for years. Um, so we made a quick uh, decision to do a split um, in our walk arounds. At the time, that was part of our SOPs. Um, since then, we've changed that. Now we, every officer needs to do a full walk around. Um, so we split our walk arounds. I went from the Alpha to the Alpha Bravo and then Charlie side. Uh, the engine officer went to the Alpha uh, Delta Charlie side. Um, we didn't get all the way around. I couldn't get around to the, because of the topography um, and a retention uh, fence for a retention pond. I couldn't get all the way past the deck that was on fire. So what we noticed when we did the walk around is it looked like it was a deck, fire on deck that was working itself up. Um, it was two stories in the front, three stories in the back. Um, style because of topography and like I said going from down to low so as we went down the topography we lost sight of the eaves at all so we couldn't see um, how far that fire had extended into the attic um, at the time so we came back up met with the engine officer in the front yard and um, he made a decision to call for a second alarm and um, that we were going to go in and do a quick search try to get out and see if there's anybody there again no one no there's no lights on anywhere no neighbors coming out. There's nothing to show that there wasn't anyone inside that house. I mean, there's cars in the driveway, a car in the front, uh, right in front of the house in the street. Um, so we made that decision. He decided to get a pull in a two and a half, um, pulled that to the front door. So we went, Tommy, or sorry, um, Kyle and I went in the front door, um, right as the hand line was being, was working its way up to the front. Uh, we went in the front door. Um, as we got in, house was, uh, completely clear smoke detectors weren't going off there was no lights on um, the best way I can describe this and I looked off to my left it looked like uh, looking at fire through an aquarium um, it's very kind of broken up um, kind of just not real clear but you know looking back on it now it's looking at it through the sunroom um, so through windows and screens and all that kind of stuff so it kind of gave a distorted look of, of where the fire was uh, so we knew exactly in the back side it was in that back area of it again started yelling um, talking, trying to get, see if anyone was in the house. Again, smoke detectors weren't going off, no lights were on, um, trying to make noise and let people know we were there. The front door was unlocked, um, so we didn't even have to force entry or anything, and that uh, clue right there a little bit, you know, this area is not the uh, kind of place you leave doors unlocked, you know, and uh, so we get there, we're in that front foyer, I asked, uh, the, as we did it, the door shut, like, slowly closed behind us, so I uh, told Kyle to open the front door again. He opened the door and uh, the engine company was at the front stoop um, getting ready to get water on the line. So uh, gave a nod to the engine officer and uh, off time or off uh, Kyle and I went up the stairs um, figuring we we're going to search that second floor. Uh, we get up to the top of the second floor. Um, large landing area with a kind of a walkway type of thing. Bedrooms to the left, bedrooms to the right. There was a double French door right to the right of us. So um, figuring that was the master bedroom. That's where I was gonna start. So we went to the right, uh, got into the uh, master bedroom. Again, completely clear. I can tell you, you know, the bedspread of the, uh, the master bed was white with little red flowers on it. Um, so extremely clear visibility for six, 10 in the morning and 
uh, that there's a little bit of light gray smoke uh, coming probably about five, four or five inches from the ceiling, kind of lazy smoke. Um, so I figured there's heat getting up into that attic, that kind of thing. And um, didn't think much more of it. Um, there was nobody in the beds. Nobody looked like someone had been sleeping in there, but there was uh, nothing there. So started sweeping with the uh, thermal imager and had uh, Kyle start searching off to the right of me. Uh, this is a large, large master bedroom enough to have a full couch with a full sitting area and TV um, all in the area in the master bedroom. So there's there's quite a bit of room uh, to move around. So um, started having Kyle search off to the right and uh, he got about 10 feet from me and um, everything went from clear to uh, completely black, extremely hot. Um, I yelled to Kyle to start coming back to me and enough time for me to start going to the ground to kneel uh, went from all black to completely all orange. Um, there was orange and red everywhere. Um, like I told you in Alabama, didn't really know where I was at. I lost complete orientation of everything. Um, started yelling to Kyle to get back to me and um, just you know, how you have that presence when you know when somebody's near you. I had that feeling with them. I kept yelling at them. Their sound was close. And uh, for whatever reason, I don't, to this day, I can't answer the question for you why, but um, there's flames that were moving sideways. And uh, those flames moving sideways to me, for some reason, clicked in that that's where the doorway was. And so uh, started moving towards those sideways uh, flames, uh, banged out through the end up going right through the door. And then uh, there was a small hall table, like half moon style hall table that was sitting near the top of the stairs. I got entangled in that and uh, totally just upended me and ended up going down the stairs, um, falling down the stairs, head went through part of the wall um on the you know in the turn area of the, of the uh, stairs it's kind of a not quite a 90 degree turn but a, a nice sloping kind of turn off there hit that and then slid down the rest of the stairs um don't really remember a lot of that part of that um but then um the engine officer uh was blowing was using the two and a half just flowing it into the house there's flames coming down the stairs um he described it as like a jet plane, jet engine just blowing out the front door. Um, he saw my white helmet laying in the front of the uh, stoop and he grabbed the, my, he reached in, grabbed my air pack and just pulled me out. Um, end up landing at the feet of the rescue officer. I looked up at him, told Kyle was up, last known upstairs and he sounded the first mayday. Um, and Kyle sounded his mayday immediately right after. And it's, like I told you before, it's clean and, and um, couldn't ask for better. I couldn't do it sitting here today. Do that good a, a process through a, for a mayday, especially in those conditions. Um, so then, um, from that point, it was it was kind of the it just it became an extremely chaotic scene. Um, everybody trying to get upstairs to get to Kyle. Um, just a complete mix of crews. Just whoever was there was the next man up and they kept working relentlessly to get up to those top of those stairs to get to Kyle, um, over and over and over. Um, I don't even know. I can't even tell you to this day, the number of attempts to get up those stairs. Um, and ultimately between a, uh, the second arriving battalion chief and a safety officer basically standing in the doorway, um, stopping those guys from going up there. And, uh, I'm, to, I'm glad they did it that, you know, looking back on it, um, cause they probably did save several people's lives, um, in that process. So that's kind of the, the actual, you know, rundown of the incident itself. Um, it's, you know, from that perspective. All right. We got a, a couple pictures here. I'll share the screen. I mean, walk us through these, uh, what these are. So. That's an aerial view from across the street of, uh, Marsh Overlook. Um, you see the retention, you see right where the edge of that circle is and the top left of it, that's right where that retention pond and all that said, like all the, all the, um, topography leaned down towards that way, feeding, feeding that way. So like I said, when we walked and did that walk, it was very difficult to see up to that roof line, uh, as well as the eaves even. And how big, these are McMansions basically. Square yes. Square as well as like, uh, 5,500, 6,000 square foot houses. That uh, picture is from Sides Charlie. It's actually taken from the house that I believe that called it in um, right after we arrived on scene. Um, 
if you look at this, these houses are actually above, if you, you know, from a topography standpoint, they're actually above the house. So they're actually looking down somewhat on the house, not directly across from it, um, from a site, from a line of sight type of thing. <clears throat> but like I said, when we came up, we didn't see that stuff in the, in the eaves or sorry, in the, uh, the roof line. Um, and some of the wind was pushing some of that back and keeping it kind of down in. Uh, this is from the neighbor's house right across the street, kind of at the AB corner of it, uh, right before we were, you can see the headlights, lights on the street. That's when I was pulling in. Again, none of these neighbors ever came out, never said anything. Um, we didn't know anything about anyone being around. I, I believe uh, from the last one, the neighbors, ex they were at a neighbor's house, but you had no idea that at a particular time. Correct. They, um, they, the, there's actually a, uh, air for, I believe an air force, uh, officer who was on the other side, living on, lived on the other side of March Overlook, saw it, drove around, knocked on the door, um, got him out of the house, and uh, then left the scene. The uh, the people who lived in the house went next door and stayed inside the next door. Um, they actually came out to let them know that they were out as the at, right after the May days had occurred. Just the first floor layout here. Sure. Correct. First floor, like I told you before, when we walked in that foyer, you know, looking off to the left is where that fire was, you know, like I said, through the sunroom and through the dining room. Yep. There's an idea where I was looking at what looked like looking at fire through an aquarium. And these are the stairs you went those up. Are, yep, those are stairs we went up, straight up. And then the second floor? Yep, up the second floor, and you can see that little walk area, walkway area, and then straight into the master bedrooms where we went. Layout. Correct. The uh, engine 12, the first line, side alpha, the front door. Engine 10 took up a backup line. And then uh, their second line also went off to the back to the side, Charlie, to do extinguishment on that fire. But the first fi first line was was engine 12s. And then uh, it was a backup line and it's kind of simultaneous uh, leader line to the back side. Okay. These are the stairs you had? The actual stairwell, you can see the whole you know, the whole process of there, yep. Um, from the command post, uh, well into the incident, this is well into um, after the May days and all that. And this may have already been at this point um, after the second uh, battalion chief had pulled efforts to, to try to get into, into the house. Um, Where you came into the master bedroom here. Correct, that's the... Uh, from the uh, LODD report um, to where we came in through the, the, uh, the French doors and uh, looking at uh, like where Kyle's body was found with the, uh, the Maltese. He was just in front of those, uh, the couches, which was in front of the windows. Um, and if you look at the other stuff, and this is where, you know, the stuff where we talk about where, yeah, you know, had that feeling he was with me. It's his Halligan bar was found at the top of the stairs. Um, he had it with us when he went into the room. Uh, so at some point it got, Either he got pushed back or we don't know. We don't know those final, you know, steps. Um, portable was next to him. Helmet had come off and his pipe hole had been left over or found over you know, a little bit of ways down the hallway, which led to the closet and bathroom. Um, so. This is uh, bringing his body out of the house, I take it. So. Yes, sir. Um, well, after the uh, incident, once the fire marshal has done their stuff and, and all that, we were... Uh, able to, to um, take him out and uh, take him to the uh, medic unit to uh, be taken to, uh, you know, the places he needed to go. So just a group afterwards, you know, just one of those, you know, brotherhood type things of us just trying to take in everything that just had occurred to us and not really knowing what was about to happen to us, so to speak. It's after. So the aftermath of the house. Yeah, not much to say about there, so. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. you, you kind of mentioned some of it. What were you uh, experienced personally as this thing's unfolding? Um, well, right after the incident and you know, all that, you know, we kind of, you know, as the incident was going, you, you start going through that your stuff goes through your mind. I mean, they were, you know, trying to keep me out of the house and push putting me over in spots. You know, I'd gotten burned. Um, 
and you know they're trying to kind of just keep me at bay a little bit and um ultimately at some point once things are done they uh a neighbor opened up their garage and we ended up kind of just being all all of us kind of shuttled down anyone who was on that first alarm assignment um kind of shuttled down to that house and just kind of just we just all kind of sat and stared at each other um we were all given well somehow somewhere you know one cell phone popped up so we all started making phone calls um to our wives and uh you know girlfriends etc um at that point the word had already started getting out um the joys of social media um and so it's just kind of as we just sat there um, we, we just kind of stared we didn't know what really to come up at all um and we really weren't given a lot of direction because i don't think anyone really knew what to be doing at that point you know um so do you have a question uh, no okay um so yeah so we sat there for a while and that was one of those things i you know i made it known to uh chief forgo the incident commander that i wasn't we weren't leaving until kyle came out of the building so um we, we hung around a while and um once we were allowed to do what you saw in that picture that's what you know um to me it was extremely important that our guys went in with them that we're coming home with them also and um so that took a little bit of a while once that was done um we folded the flag off of off of his body um i i carried that um with me and um we were asked to to get our get our gear and um they put us on a school bus and shipped us down to one of the stations um where it had that had a bingo hall and um kind of where they put us all and it was, they asked us to start doing written statements and and all that kind of thing um it's the first time i got a little bit of medical care where the uh engine company officer was with me he wrapped me up a little bit for the burns and all that kind of stuff and then uh we sat and did our written statements um to this day i don't really know what i wrote um i don't remember any of of the actual what i wrote down um I'd like to think it pretty much matched what i just said but you know, i can't really tell you that because i really don't remember it um but at that point once we get all that they were kind of like well you can go home you can do whatever you know you think is right for you um so i went to the hospital um started getting the burn care stuff done um and most of the guys all kind of just i don't say went their way but i think a lot of them just kind of just went somewhere in disbelief um so the next couple of days were um complete blur and blank um no real idea um which day was up or down um in regards to a lot of it um so um i would come into work even though i was put on light duty i would come in every day sit with the guys at 12 the uh, engine company officer who was there that day was on a detail um and so they slid him over to the truck to take my place on a detail long-term detail while i was out um so it's really kind of um you know weird sitting there talking to him and he's now sitting in my spot for a while and um you know him and i have been good friends since recruit school and so you know, from a friendship standpoint, it was, it was really easy to talk, but it was real difficult to talk at the same time. Um, and as the days went on, um, you know, the funeral process, the investigations, all that stuff just all kind of poured into each other. Um, I don't really know which day was which with a lot of that stuff. Um, so the department at some point, you know, before the funeral, um, the volunteers at the station um, put that truck out of service and um, did a phenomenal memorial type uh, thing in front of it, you know, with the, all the flowers and pictures and all that. And then for some reason, the uh, the department started cycling everybody through. So we had every, um, every station uh, and every unit within the county um, at some point over a couple day period came by the station see the memorial and see us um and as you can imagine the first question was what happened you know to all of us um and so the group of us you know between um you know tower 12 engine engine 12 and engine 10 rescue 10 those, those four units that are the first four early on scene um just continually getting asked over and over and over you know for several days straight um became uh, real daunting to us, real uh, um, extremely difficult um, and uh, almost to a point where we as a group circled the wagons and um, kind of just shut everybody else out. 
um, from a from a uh, probably self preservation kind of perspective at this point, you know, looking back on it. Um, so that's what we did. I mean, you know, and that that ended up leading to a lot of uh, bad behaviors, so to speak, after the fact. You know, like I said, we we circled the wagons on a lot of things, and it was nobody else understood us. Nobody knew what was going on with us. It was that kind of thing, and you know led to us going out drinking, let us going out to just being, you know, finding reasons to just be with us and that's it. Um, so from the department standpoint, we definitely had a lot of that, just um, us versus them mentality um, and no fault of anybody's, just us feeling that way. Um, so we did a lot of that self-preservation type behaviors and all that. Um, we worked our way through, you know, for me personally, um, I got, I was married, um, March 3rd, 2007. So I've been married a month and handful of days. Um, so, you know, my honeymoon year of marriage was, was completely taken away. Um, especially, you know, from my wife's perspective and, uh, you know, we, you know, I sat in the basement a lot depressed, not knowing why or what was going on. Um, or why this kind of happened, why Kyle, not me, you know, that whole thought process and uh, sat there for a while. I mean, it took, took quite a while to get to process all that stuff. And, um, you know, it took my wife basically kind of, you know, we were getting ready to get to have the report come out and um, for the, uh, the investigation and actually get back to some of the investigation stuff. Cause you know, so eight, you know, all those different agencies coming in doing the investigation. So you're reliving everything again, they just constantly poke, poke, um, and then our own internal, um, investigation was probably the hardest out of, out of all of them. Um, you know, there, we set and picked over five, six seconds of time, you know, of what was done, what wasn't done. Um, the report was phenomenally and extremely well done, um, in regards to looking at, you know, no stone unturned type of thing. And, um, you know, like I said, you know, hindsight, 15 years later, it's definitely, a great read now um, at the time extremely painful um but everything in that report is factual i mean if they couldn't verify it um in two ways or three ways they wouldn't put it in the report so there's several things in the report that were done on the fire ground that aren't in the report because they couldn't verify it because it's only something that happened between kyle and myself which uh, again right way to do the report you know factually um so like i said you know right before that report came out my wife came in one day from work and she looked at me sitting in the basement, just, you know, feeling bad for myself kind of thing. And she looked at me and said, uh, either you need to get help or I'm leaving, you know, typical fireman mentality is I need to be hit upside the head with the two by four in order to, to see it. I didn't see there was problems. There were obviously problems there. Um, and so the day of the report, I reached out to uh, Vicki Taylor um, and asked, uh, finally at the point where I, I need help. And she goes, well, I'm glad I've been waiting for you. You know, that kind of like, I knew, you know, um, kind of thing. And, um, for those who don't know, um, Vicki Taylor is married to one of our retired battalion chiefs here in the County. So we have a phenomenal resource and Vicki does a lot of stuff with, uh, the national fallen firefighters. And, um, she's a huge resource right in our own backyard that, um, we didn't take advantage of right away. Um, but we definitely did as time went on and um, but either way. So she set me up with a um, therapist and we started the, 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 the mental road process and um, talking with her. It was one of those that, uh, all right, let's, let's work on you, but we also need to work on your marriage type stuff. So we, I did individual counseling and then we did some marriage counseling. Um, the marriage counseling stuff, the first day, um, she says, we know your guys are newly married, yada, yada, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, but, uh, while we work through these things, don't get pregnant. Um, as I told you in Alabama and got some good laughs out of it. Um, my wife and I did a, an escape, uh, just get away over a Valentine's weekend to Las Vegas. And, um, what happened in Vegas didn't stay in Vegas. Um, my oldest son uh, was born nine months later. Um, but like I said, then also in, in down in Alabama was that, uh, that gave us, um, my wife and I, something to fight for and make things work. And still to this day, you know, 15 years later, we're still married, not perfectly married, but we're married. And, um, you know, we work at it every day. Um, so 
the, the journey itself um, is the emotions are all over the place. They still are some days, you know, some days are easier than others. Some days are hard. Um, but it's talking about it and keeping Kyle's memory alive. It definitely helps with that. Helping others uh, definitely helps along those on that process. Um, so I don't know where more to take that, you know, in regards to, to it, but that's, you know, yeah, I, I truly appreciate you sharing because I think one thing people don't understand is the impact this has on people. We can talk about the tactics and all that kind of stuff all day long, but the sure. impact and the long term impacts on the people. So I truly appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, I mean, and you know, that's just a snippet of my story, and I can go on and on. There's a whole bunch of other guys, you know, um, you know, the engine company officer, him and his wife had, you know, everybody had problems at some level. We had several people that um, ended up being terminated for alcohol use or DUIs. Um, you, know, you name it behaviorally, a lot of stuff happened after the fact um, that, you know, created personnel problems that people were end up separating employment. Um, and, you know, I think if we may have been able to get people some help earlier, might have helped some of that, but some of that I think was probably destined to happen anyways. Um, it's hard to, hard to really look at it completely without thinking that some of those behaviors are already there, um, just hadn't really surfaced yet. Um, so, you know. Deal. You know, what, as far as a confidence, confidence issue as a company officer, you got to go back to work. Oh, yeah. Um, How does that go? So. It, it was, I mean, in talking, like I said, I went back the next or like the day or two later, but some of those were appointments going into the burn center and things like that um, as an outpatient. Um, it wasn't easy. I mean, you talk about, you know, we're all those, we're all firemen who think we know everything and can do everything and, and you're almost invincible at some level. And, um, to being completely every bit of wind taken out of your sail. Um, it was, it took a while, um, to get, to get the, uh, the mojo kind of thing back. Um, for me, I had to sit in the station and watch these guys go out the, the door for several weeks. You know, um, it was kind of eerie for the first two days. Um, the engine at station 12 and the, and the tower, they didn't run any calls. And, and this is a place that you know, the engine normally runs 15 to 18 calls truck was, you know, six to 10, depending on the day. Um, so it was, it's not unusual. It was extremely unusual for not run any calls out of that firehouse at all. Um, but after that, you know, they started running calls and, you know, not long after, I think a week and a half, two weeks later, they're, you know, they're working fire, you know, in a small townhouse and I'm sitting on radio listening to it versus being part of it. Um, but um, our department was phenomenally supportive in regards to you know, if it's something we needed, all we had to do was ask, um, or if we thought we needed it, well, we had to do was ask and it was there, um, within some reasonable time, um, even enough to the point where they, um, brought back one of our old retired battalion chiefs that, um, we all grew up under, you know, kind of a mentor to a lot of us. And he would come back in and just check on us, you know, very routinely just to kind of make sure we were doing okay. Cause he knew, they knew that we would talk to him versus somebody else. Um, so confidence wise, it took a while, um, even to this day, sometimes there's days I don't have the same self-confidence that I would on another day. Um, but for the most part, it, it's, I think it's one of those, like, you know, time heals a lot of wounds. Um, probably the best thing for me was getting back up on that ladder truck. Um, once I was healed up and ready to go, I, I was back on it. Um, took a little while to get another fire, but that first fire was extremely, um, nerve wracking to say the least. Um, and now it's turning everything into making me a better officer because of the incident. Um, I can tell you now for, from personal experience with it, um, I, I track where everybody is. I know where, where people are on an incident in a fire ground a whole lot better than I probably ever did uh, back then. Um, and just understanding what is happening um, fire ground wise. Um, from a personnel side of things, I think I'm a little more approachable, a little more um, not a little more, I guess, easy going with it. You know, I'll sit and talk and have conversations with people in regards to what they're doing, what they're feeling, uh, where before I probably was just a young officer, it was kind of more of a punk, you know, um, probably the best way to put it. Um, but it took a while, I mean, you know, it took time. It took, uh, guys working, you know, that, that I had a lot of respect for reaching out and just having someone there, having someone to talk to. Um, about a year and a half after the incident, um, Vicki Taylor brought in a couple guys from, uh, FDMY as part of their, their part of their support team. And that was the first time we got to talk to people that had 
been through a line of duty death. And uh, that's probably the first time I really got to actually start to normalize the feelings and the thoughts and all these things that were, were happening to us, you know, years after the fact. And uh, that's why, like, you know, we talked earlier, it's so important with that, the cohort of having somebody there um, that's been there um, to normalize some of the, the things that are going on and just help you along the path. Um, because it is a long road road and you do definitely isolate yourself and, um, you know, put yourself in a, you know, in a, you easily slide into a world of depression if you don't work on it. Um, so having somebody who could help you is vital. And I'll put a shameless plug while we're talking about this for the uniform support group, chief to chief incident commander, incident commander, company officer, company officer. Uh, that's what we have these groups. That's what Chief Reese is a member of to help other people through it. So uh, please go on our website. The information's on there and, and take a look at those. So uh, you mentioned your confidence. How about your cruise? Was there any issue with the cruise confidence in, in going back to work? Quite a bit. I mean, it, it took a while. I mean, it was everything. I mean, we were we were a pretty good machine, but uh, it definitely destroyed us um, confidence wise. If you look back, um, the engine company officer had just been promoted lieutenant uh, the Friday before this uh, Monday. Um, not that he was an inexperienced individual, it's just, it was a brand new off, as an you know, officer, actually wearing an officer helmet and that kind of thing. Um, the kid in the bucket or in the, uh, engine, uh, officer's bucket, pulling the hand line, all that first fire he's ever been on, just gotten out of rookie school. Um, only, you know, a month or so prior, maybe not even quite that. Um, so those guys got handed a heck of a, you know, fire and heck of a, a, a thing to try to handle and. You know, both those guys are still on the job. I, we both, you know, we talk constantly about things and, you know, there's those, there was thoughts of just this, this job ain't for me now. I'm done, you know, that kind of thing and wanting to quit or wanting to leave. And, um, and they're both here. They're both still great individuals and great officers now. And, um, yeah, but as a department, um, it completely shook the whole department to its core. Um, even people that weren't assigned there or assigned on the fire or anything like that, it, it affected everybody. There was, there was, throughout the whole department, there, I mean, I can't, I, the list can go on, on, sure. you know, the, the problems or things that, that came up later on, or the people that thought, you know, one of my best friends was, was on a rescue, was on the other side of the county, and he's thinking it was me the whole time driving down, you know, 25, 30 minute response, and, you know, um, I don't think I've ever gotten a hug so big from a guy, you know, kind of thing, I mean, it was when he saw me. Um, but it's one of those, everybody, everybody at the time was, you know, was affected at the time we were only about 350 people you know, we've doubled in size, actually more than doubled in size since then. Um, so back then everybody knew everybody. It was kind of one of those, you know, it, like I said, it affected a lot of people all the way up every rank, people, even that were off, you know, families, everyone, a lot of things started just kind of unraveling and falling apart, you know, problems that may have not been there suddenly started appearing there and uh it, it took a while to uh to kind of write that ship um yeah we talked about changes in the agency you talked about the report especially the the, the, the county report any comments yeah. you want to make on that um yeah i mean like i said when we talked the other day about this it's hard to go and just pinpoint one uh specific or two specific changes within the department there's there's so many that we've done um and you know some and we're still evolving to this day with with a lot of the report um you know and the recommendations out of there i mean i really would recommend anyone who's on here or anyone who watches this to just go take some time and read through that report um because the committee that that took this report they really did leave no rock unturned and uh they looked at everything from training to how we do business to sops to the equipment we use um and came up with recommendations through that. I don't even know the number, to be honest with you. Um, but there's hundreds of recommendations that, you know, we slowly keep plugging away at. Um, and a lot of these are, have gone from, you know, department-wide to a regional type of thing. So we operate under the COG region and um, multiple counties all are trying to operate on the exact same page. And some of these recommendations are, are from, you know, because of that. And so Kyle's legacy is still may, affecting change 15 years later. Right. Um, so like I said, it's kind of hard to just pinpoint one or two. Sure. We'll include a link when we, we post this to, to that report so people can take a look at that. So appreciate that. Thanks. 15 years since the incident. What's one or two things you want firefighters to know about this incident? 
Um, to me, I mean, the world is starting to, you know, the fire world is starting to really latch on to the fire behavior types of stuff um, in regards to, you know, knowing flow paths and knowing how the fire behaves. It's, the information isn't new. It's been around for a long time, um, but we've never accepted or never tried to really dive into the, the scientific world of how fire acts and how a fire behaves. And um, to me, I think that's a, there's, we're doing ourselves a disservice of, by not understanding the, what, what we fight. Um, so to me, probably one of the biggest things is, is understanding and not knowing the, how fire truly behaves and what it does and um, how application of water and ventilation and all that truly does affect uh, what we do every day. Um, the other part of that is the mental health side. And you're starting to see that in the fire service as a collective whole, which I think is great. I still think we're way behind the times in regards to what it is we have. Um, I mean, I'm extremely lucky. I'm in a resource rich, you know, area that um, as part of this report and part of that, you know, we have our own mental um, health group, you know, that works for works for the fire department and police department, you know, specifically for us, um, which is a great resource right in our own backyard. And that Vicki Taylor now runs that with multiple clinicians. And, you know, for us, it's any fireman, any police officer, anyone from the 911 communication center and their families are no charge, no cost, just make them an appointment and it's there. Um, so to me, the mental health is, is huge because there's a lot of stuff that we see and deal with every day that, um, that we need to, to address and, and talk about. And it's not, there's no, no reason to be afraid to do it and you know, get rid of the stigma of seeing a therapist. I was the same way. There's no way I'm going to go see a, some therapist who's going to hook electrodes to my head and shock me and all those kinds of things. When, um, But the reality is by the time you get there, once you start talking, it's, it's unbelievable how truly therapeutic it is just to be able to get that information off and out and have somebody who's willing to just give you, you know, some feedback or some other ways of looking at things. And, you know, you know, the, the year long therapy stuff for me, you know, the, the bulk of it was a year. And then I, every once in a while I go back in for a tune up, I call it, you know, just sometimes you just need to just, just need to talk. Um, but uh, that year long was extremely difficult, extremely hard. You know, there's a lot of interflection, a lot of just, you know, walking yourself through um, how to heal and how to get yourself better and how to, you know, refocus uh, a lot of the, the stuff. So, and like I said, it was a long process, but um, to me, I think the mental health is probably right where it's at and where we need to be focusing a lot of efforts for what we do, you know, because it really, in reality, it's not these like large events that are going to get us. It's the 400 little events that suddenly, you know, weigh on us to a point where we can't take it anymore. Um, so to me, getting out there and being willing to sit down with somebody every once in a while and talk is, is invaluable. Excellent. Having gone through the, the line of duty uh, uh, event, what, what advice would you give other officers, firefighters on that, that experience something like that? Uh, probably the biggest thing for me, and it just goes right back in line with that mental health stuff is, is ask for help early. Um, don't wait until it's too late. You know, like I said, there's multiple great firemen that were in this department that, you know, aren't firemen anymore because they chose to drink and get behind a wheel of a car or you name the personnel issues that, that, you know, those vices created. Um, to me, even my own self as I, you know, it took me a long time to start getting help, you know, years behind the behind before could have been a lot better off. Um, so to me is don't be afraid to ask for the help. Um, don't wait till the help has to come because it's not going to come to you right away. I mean, I lived for a year not really thinking there was a problem. Um, I thought everything was seemed pretty normal and reality it was complete S show, so to speak, you know, yeah. um, took my wife, like I said, walking in and hit me upside the head with a two by four, you know, so to speak to, to go, Hey, you need to figure this out. We need to work on getting this better. Um, you know, of course it takes an ultimatum, you know, cause we're firemen and we don't listen real well. Um, so to me, I mean, that, that getting that help early on reaching out for that help or, or getting that, those resources, because they're definitely there. Um, you just got to start asking. Yeah. Excellent. So. Hey, just a couple more slides here, a little, uh, some of the uh, tributes to, to Kyle. There's an elementary school named after him um, here. Roadway, 
just some dedication. So just real nice tributes that were done in, in a period of time afterwards. So yeah, the, the county, the department, um, everyone has has been huge on getting that. You know, a lot of the reason, you know, our union and our fire department, as well as uh, Kelly uh, Kyle's sister, who's a teacher, and that was a lot of the reason why we were we pushed very hard, and it took us a long time to get Kyle's name put on a school. Um, but those are some of the the reasonings behind why it came that way. But um, it's a a lasting uh, dedication to Kyle. Like I said, you know, 15 years later, and we're still still talking about him. We're still learning, and we're still teaching a lot of other people about, you know, from the reports and, and that kind of stuff. So I think it's huge um, that 15 years later, his his legacy still moves on. Excellent. Chief, anything else you'd like to, to close out with us? Anything else to add? So. Sir, I mean, I'm willing to share my story anytime, anywhere. Um, so... I truly appreciate it. I think it's huge, and uh, you know, for people not only to see the tactical and the strategic side of things, but the, the impact, the human element of it is, is huge. And truly appreciate you sharing with us today. So. I appreciate your time. I appreciate you letting me do this. Absolutely. Thanks. So, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, a little bit about the next. So Thursday, July twenty eighth, fourth Thursday in July, uh, I'm going to talk with uh, former assistant fire management officer Steve Esser with the South Dakota Wildland. Uh, fire suppression division. It's a wildland fire that resulted in the line of duty death of the fire, uh, firefighter Tram Trampus Haskovitz. Uh, uh, it was burned over in a wildland fire. So we're going to focus on the wildland uh, next month. So hope you can join us. We'll send out some more information on that as well as this recording here soon. Chief, thanks again. Thank you all for joining us. And you, it's a great day. We'll see you all soon. Take care. Take care. See ya.